Hello. In 1905, the German sociologist Max Weber published an essay suggesting a connection between religion and the spread of capitalism. Weber had noticed that the countries in which capitalism had been most successful tended to be mainly Protestant. He believed that this was not a coincidence, and he argued that certain types of religious belief had created a particular ethic, giving rise to a society in which hard work was celebrated and where the wealthy invested their money rather than spending it on luxuries. Weber called his essay The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, and a century later it's still seen as one of the founding works of modern sociology. The idea of the Protestant work ethic has been enormously influential, although many later thinkers have disputed Weber's basic arguments. With me to discuss Max Weber's The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism are Peter Ghosh, Fellow in History at St Anne's College, Oxford, Sam Wimster, Honorary Professor at the University of New South Wales, and Linda Woodhead, Professor of Sociology of Religion at Lancaster University. Peter Ghosh, can you tell us a bit more about Max Weber's background and early life? Well, so Weber is born in 1864, and that's a slightly symbolic date because it's just before the unification, the political unification of Germany in 1866-71. And the reason I draw attention to this is that I think we today tend to think that modern German history is heavily dominated by politics and that it's a, you know, it's a story from Bismarck to Hitler. Um, now, that is obviously, there's a lot of mileage in that, of course. But when that politically unified state was created, that was literally just an overlay on a previous inheritance. And the previous inheritance didn't go away. And that previous inheritance was, in fact, a set of quite small what we might call city-states, all of which had universities. And for centuries, the Germans, not having had uh, a, a strong political identity, had in fact got an enormous cultural identity. And Weber is in many ways the product of the last generation that really, in fact, benefited from that heritage, uh, that he's a great encyclopedist. Um, you know, we, we tend to say he knew about sort of practically everything. Uh, and you can trace him back to, shall we say, people like Marx or the philosopher Hegel or earlier in time, the philosopher Leibniz. Um, speaking about his more particular background, uh, he comes from what uh, we call the professional bourgeoisie, the, the high, the haute bourgeoisie. Uh, it's quite an elite class. Uh, he grows up in the fashionable West End of Berlin in Charlottenburg. And he has two very interesting parents. Uh, one is a lawyer and a politician. And I should stress that in Germany, law is a very, very important subject and does not in any way simply imply that you go away and earn lots of money as it might do in, in Britain. Um, and the father is basically very secular and not ha has no time for religion whatsoever. Uh, the other parent is equally important, his mother, uh, Elena, and she is what, what the Germans would call a Christian social, and I suspect probably the easiest way we can render this into English is to say that she's a Christian, something like a Christian socialist. Uh, she's very much uh, a liberal social reformer uh, and is passionately committed to the idea of, as it were, doing good in the world. Um, and I would like to suggest that Weber's very curious and distinctive religious views are approximately equally derived from the two parents. On the one hand, the secular father, and on the other hand, the religious mother. And she was also very wealthy. He had a, how did he kickstart his career in his 20s? Um, as I say, he comes from a sort of bourgeois elite. Um, which, which book set him off? Which book drew attention to him as somebody who was on the scene? Uh, it's, a, it's a very, very long tome about agrarian labour east of the River Elba. That'll do. Why did he write that? <laughs> uh, he's, he's asked to write it by the, a, a sort of a social science policy group called the Foreign for Sozial Politique. And what drew him to that? This polymath you speak of, he decided to do agrarian policy in East Germany. OK. Um, he's, well, he's very interested in the Junkers. Uh, he's a left liberal politician. He doesn't like the Junkers much. Uh, in the modern day, and his great idea is to say, well, these Junkers, this is actually it has a certain sort of contemporary resonance, these Junkers are using immigrant labour, they're using Polish labour, 
And he said, well, if you're a true German nationalist, we surely don't want that sort of thing going on. And therefore, he says, uh, if you're a real German nationalist, you'll break up the great estates. Sam Wemster, what was the significant influence? We've talked about the background, this political lawyer uh, father. We've talked about the mother who was known as the saint for, for her charitable work and for her great presence in, in Berlin. Can you tell us... Uh, uh, the basic influence. Let's start with the religious views. His mother was very influential on him. We know that he was, uh, he was, um, uh, he started off as a boy as very. Let's start with that. Well, when you say very religious, one has to qualify that somewhat because, as Peter's just said, these are educated parents, and the mother was very educated. She had a classical education, uh, so she would know Latin and Greek. She was she was tutored privately by Germany's leading historian, a man called Gervinus. And uh, her own religious upbringing uh, was that, well, it was somebody called Pastor Ziff, I think. And he said, you know, the, the, the New Testament gospel of parables and miracles, that's for the simple people. We don't actually believe as, as sort of grown-up middle-class people in this kind of superstition. But but they, she clearly had a very strong ethical outlook. And she got this from from the... the, 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 the the, actually, they were called Fallenstein's. The, the, the mother's side were Fallenstein, a number of sisters, and they all had this ghastly experience of losing very young children, infants, at the age of two, three, four. They died, diphtheria, whatever. It was a common event. And for them, the ethical, religious question was how on earth can you have a Christian God who allows such things? And so. Helena, for instance, and she discussed this with 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 Max as a young man. Um, how how what is the status of a, of a child who dies? How does God allow it? What happens to the soul of the child? And an American preacher, Unitarian, very unsuperstitious, not much interested in the rituals of the church, had this very humanist notion of what happens to souls when they die. And that was very comforting and very sensibly talked about. But religion was around, it's spoken of in terms of ethics, but still we can call it religion without crossing a line too, too, too much. And we're told that Weber, when he was 16, had put it behind him. Uh, he'd moved on from that. He, he, he had great empathy for religions, but he didn't have the music of religion or whatever, that, something like that phrase. What other, um, we've talked about religion, what other uh, influences are on him? Is he reading, is he influenced by the economic theory at the time? The, can you just fill it out a little bit more? Well, he trains, trains as a lawyer, a jurist, an academic lawyer, but he decides law is boring. Then he goes into economics, which is this, this study of the agrarian question. So he's an expert on, on, on farming and, and why, and the sociological side of it starts to sneak in. Why are these farmers, peasants moving from uh, the countryside into the city? So they're coming from east of the Elbe into Berlin. And so there's this huge social question. And we know he's interested in classics. And uh, yes, he's always making allusions to classical Rome. That's what his second PhD was on, the uh, Roman agrarian history, which is uh, an amazing work, which is very little read. And he's sort of floating free intellectual, isn't he? He, does, he isn't attached to a particular university with a particular discipline. He moves around partly because, I suppose, he had the, uh, the means to do so from one discipline, as you use that word, to another. Well, the Minister of Education, the Prussian Minister of Education, wanted to keep him in, in Berlin as Professor of Commercial Law. Uh, Weber didn't like being told what to do or being patronised, and he, he found a post in, in Baden, Freiburg, as a professor of economics, which at a very young age. And then he moved from, from Baden about 1894 to Heidelberg, where he became professor of uh, economics. Uh, and it's about this time that his life starts to go awry, because to get to, to go through well, an assistant professor of law, uh, where he, and then he was teaching commercial law uh, and economics, financial economics, banking law, banking, the nature of banking. So he's, he's mastered two disciplines by the age of 30. And 
this is where, and he's also working on commissions on the stock exchange. And his life starts to come unpacked at this point because he's overworking. And he has, a, in effect, a breakdown, which lasts for three or four years. And out of, after that, he writes this book. So can you tell us, what, before we talk about this essay rather than this book, can you tell us about the, um, the drift of notions in Western Europe, particularly Germany, at that particular time, the turn of the century? Well, we've just heard about the, the strange political context he grows up in. Of course, this is a time when nations are growing. You've got fantastic national experiments in places like France and Italy. Germany's rather different. So he's born in Prussia. Prussia becomes part of the German Empire. And it's really a, it's not, it's a new state, but it's a mishmash. It's partly an old dynasty with Kaiser and the Chancellor being these strong men. It's partly a federation, it's partly a representative system, it's partly a despotism. It's, it's not a political laboratory like the USA was at the same time. It's more like a witch's cauldron and we know that it would bubble up in all sorts of ways in the future. So politically it's a mess and, and actually Weber's not a great political thinker or theorist, perhaps for that reason. But more interestingly, and this really explains Weber, what's happening in his lifetime in the new German Empire is firstly a very rapid transition to capitalism. So the Reich in the late 19th century is urbanising incredibly quickly uh, and it's moving to industrial capitalism at a breakneck speed and large scale, technologically advanced, lots of industry. Um, the law is being rationalised, you know, commercial law is being rationalised, new corporations are growing up. And it's happening incredibly quickly. It's happened much slower in, in, in Britain, for example. So, oh, he's seeing it. He's living through this unbelievable transition. And the, and the second thing uh, is bureaucracy. I mean, one thing that, the, that Germany is good at is bureaucracy and proud of. A massive... Uh, civil service is probably leading the world in terms of developing a modern bureaucracy. Uh, there, there were other places. Austria, Hungary had a, very, had a very powerful bureaucracy. France is developing one. The Indian civil service. But Germany has an extensive bureaucracy through which the state extends into life. Can I ask you, he comes out of this, we told it was a very severe breakdown. His wife had to help him uh, against taking his own life sometimes. It was, happened for, for four years. Why did he come out of that in 1905 to write this essay, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism? What, do you know what uh, led him into that specific direction? He goes, he, he travels widely um, at the time of his breakdown. He, he goes around the world. Uh, he, he spends time in the USA, for example, uh, and he's, he's looking all the time uh, at the parallels, urbanisation, move to capitalism, bureaucracy, and he's looking at all the factors that might be causing that in different parts of the world. And uh, it's always been, as we heard before, it was always held uh, that capitalism, why, why are some countries more economically successful at this time? Why are they modernising more quickly? Why is civilization being driven by some countries? Well, they're Protestant. I mean, this was part of what, what people in this country, in the States, in Germany thought. But no one had really explained why. I mean, often it was popularly thought, well, God is, God is blessing the Protestant countries. Weber wanted to come to a deeper answer to that. So he, he, out of his experience, on the ground experience, going around the world and answering this big question, why are these certain Protestant countries in the northwest of Europe really steaming ahead? Uh, so that's brutally simple. OK, so can you make it more complicated, Peter Ghosh, please? Uh, uh, and give us some summary of the points he's trying to make in the Protestant ethic. I think perhaps the first thing one should say, and one, I think one has to be a bit honest here and say this is one of the most disputed texts in the whole of the 20th century. What do you mean by disputed? Uh, you mean, is it any good? No, I mean that basically if you take any three academics, and, and I, I suspect that means the three of us around this table, and ask them to summarise its argument, I, I suspect we would all come up... I'm, I'm not saying completely different answers, but we, there would be very considerable differences of opinion. And, and I think this is to an extraordinary degree... Uh, it, it's an unusual text in that respect. I mean, obviously, all texts are disputed in some sense. Well, can we have your version? Uh, indeed. Right. What do you so, think it's about, in summary? This is a text about ethics, and this is clearly announced in the title, because it says the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, and the word spirit means ethic, and the word ethic is used synonymously with spirit in the text. And the transition 
that the problem Weber has has worked out is that in the, at the end of the 19th century, whatever is wrong with the New Testament uh, in terms of parables and miracles, uh, New Testament ethics are still considered to be very much alive and well. Uh, and, and, and a typical New Testament ethic, which is in fact discussed quite a lot in the text, is love thy neighbour. Uh, and what Weber says about love thy neighbour, he's not against it on any personal grounds at all, but he says this is irrelevant in the modern world. Uh, and it's irrelevant for two, two reasons. One is uh, it implies that when we behave, uh, there are absolutely right ways of doing things. And the other obvious problem with love thy neighbour is that it also implies that when we behave, we are thinking about unique individuals. And Weber says, no, no, well, alas, in the modern world, uh, we've got this world that Linda was talking about, where, in fact, we have large impersonal structures and where, in fact, the ways we behave are, are not simply matters of what is, you know, in some sense, right and wrong to us in our heart of hearts. Uh, most obviously, uh, and this is the example he gives in the text, he says, well, uh, in a capitalist society, you have to obey the laws of the market. Uh, that's not an ethical point, uh, and that's why he says he can't quite describe it as the, he doesn't really like to call it the capitalist ethic. But nonetheless, this is a way you have to behave. So um, what, what, what interests him is how you got from the original love thy neighbour situation to the modern world. Um, and picking up a point that you yourself made, Weber undoubtedly says the only true source of ethics lies in religion. That's the only force that's powerful enough to generate ethics. And then he tries to bring it in, which is the big, uh, which is a big project, isn't it? Really? Exactly. Yes. To try to bring it in with economics and law and the changes is one of the factors. One of the factors bringing uh, modern capitalism about but unusual in the, in the consensus of factors of the time. I mean, the, the one point I would make about capitalism is that capitalism is a good deal more than an economic system. Uh, capitalism, as far as Weber is concerned, is a cast of mind. Yes. And a, he has a wonderful phrase where he calls it the economic way of viewing things, and he means viewing life in general, uh, all spheres of life. Uh, Sam Wimser, he, uh, uh, going on from that, he makes frequent use of the word rationalism. Would you tell us what he means by that and how he applies it the if i can just explain the notion of, of rel religious vacation which is is uh, something that frames capitalist behavior but the framing of capitalist behavior as rational behavior economic rationality the idea of calculating every situation in terms of profitability your labor uh how much it's costing you. If you're a capitalist entrepreneur, you're looking for market opportunities. This is the economic rationality. Yes. Now, he says that there's a religious basis for this fundamental framework of thinking, how capitalists think sort of automatically, right, by the 19th century. It's never been automatic to think like that ever before. This is what Weber is saying. No civilization has brought in a capitalist mentality that has this natural frame of reference that we always calculate the profit, we always know what the bottom line is. And an example of this rationalist thinking in economics is, for instance, double entry bookkeeping, which appears in, actually it's 1485, it comes out of Italy. And this, this is an example of, of rationalism. Somebody has sat down and thought, uh, we're going to apply mathematical arithmetic ideas to our business. And the whole thing about uh, a budget uh, is that you know how much you're putting into the business on a yearly basis and what's producing the profit. Now, Weber says this, this you know, could have, could have led to an interesting slow development of capitalism, but real, what really kick-started the capitalist mentality in the way that we understand it, or used to understand it, is the notion of religious vocation. And therefore you have this... Vocation. Vocation. Yes, yeah. um, profession it becomes, but it, it's a religious vocation. And he, he, this is what the essay is about, how this comes from Luther, who translates the, the, the Bible into German, and the notion of occupation, station in life, he calls vocation. 
And so a vocation is then seen to have an economic uh, reference. Can you tell us how that, can you, no, can you take that on, tell us how the notion, uh, Luther's notion of vocation, of uh, having a vocation in this world and not being in a monastery, didn't like monasteries, wanted to shut them down and praying for what might happen in the next world and living your life by that standard. Why the vocation was so radical and how, um, <clears throat> Sam's given us a very good introduction to it, how mm. that transferred mm. into his theory of bringing religion into the notion of the origins of modern capitalism. So he's trying to see what is it about Protestantism as opposed to Catholicism that's, that's, that's got this, that may have caused the bringing about of, ca of capitalism. And he emphasises the huge difference between the Protestants, who, starting with Luther, we've just heard, say, actually, what God requires isn't that you shut yourself away in a monastery. It's not that you become a vessel for God, that you spend your whole time being filled up with God in spiritual discipline, cloistered away. Luther says, no, what matters, and drawing on the New Testament, is, he quotes Paul, that you stay in the calling which God has given you. You live out your worldly vocation. So what God is asking you to do isn't to spend all your time singing psalms and worshipping him. It's to be a tool of God, a tool rather than a vessel. It's to work out God's purposes in the world, in the worldly calling in which you're called. It might be a broadcaster, it might be a carpenter, it might be a lawyer. Those are the vocations, and it's through fulfilling those worldly vocations that you please God, not by spending your whole time shut away so in worship. So how does this body. link into capitalism? So it gives a religious justification. It becomes your religious calling uh, to work hard, to be successful in your worldly calling. It adds that justification. And Weber says he add to that other features of Calvinism in particular. Uh, it's anti-hedonistic. Uh, so you may be very financially successful in living out your vocation, but you're not shouldn't be frittering away the money. So you save it, you reinvest it. This is how capital starts to build up. So the religious ethic inadvertently, you know, these are, these are unintended consequences. Inadvertently, it gives rise to investment, capital accumulates. And then he adds this, this other element. He noticed that Calvin in particular had a doctrine called predestination. Calvin thought that God this is being... This 16th century theologian Swiss, right? Calvin? Yeah. Yes. Calvin introduces the idea, he's trying to explain, if God is all-knowing and all-powerful, surely God knows from the beginning of time whether I'm going to be saved or damned. And Calvin says, yes, he did know that. Uh, and people, but people didn't know themselves. So we worry, am I predestined to salvation or damnation? And this created... Uh, 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 Weber thought, a sense of anxiety. And it's that kind of psychological tension that drives people to work even harder and prove through their worldly success that they are saved. Excellent. Peter, you put your hand up. Do you want to say what you wanted to say and then take that on? Yes, I, I, I just wanted to add a little gloss to that, that I, I agree with absolutely everything Lynn has been saying. But I think we can put this also in a more modern secular language. And, and one of the most distinguished th distinctive things about this text is precisely the way that Weber, unlike I think most of us, moves quite easily and seamlessly from the religious world of the 17th century, which is what the text is ostensibly about, and a very secular world in the 20th century. So, for example, when he's talking about the vocation, what he does is he takes this German word Beruf, and the German word Beruf has both this rather high ethical sounding meaning of vocation or calling but it also simply means your census occupation so and what, what when weber says well actually modern man is tied up with his vocation what he's actually describing is the world that we all live in today where we know that if we are not in employment that's bad that's actually we feel ethically quite deficient uh, or again he's describing the ethic in, in effect of corporation man who lives simply for his job you see what I mean? By, by the 20th century, the whole religious route, as he calls it, has been left behind, but the ethic has been retained. Uh, and, and the point I want to stress here is that, in fact, this is at once both a very religious text in its historical origin, but in its outcome, it's profoundly secular uh, and, and does represent a world that I think is very familiar to all of us today. Uh, Sam Wimster, what, can you give us some notion of the evidence 
uh, the range of evidence that Weber brought to bear to prove, as it were, as he thought, well, uh, his argument. It can be, it, as you said, it, it's an essay. He gave it to a lady friend, Mina Tobler, and she read it. She was a pianist, not, not, not a social scientist, and she said, I read it as a, as a great novel, as a great personality, as she put it. It's this unfolding notion of the spirit. And the spirit he picks up in the monasteries, he picks up in Calvinism, he picks it up in, in the secular Benjamin Franklin, Time is Money, you remember him, the, the, that you've always got to work hard because that increases your credit. He, he takes it on into the Methodist movement uh, because the Methodist movement is very important for introducing religion to the masses and they had the idea of work brings you salvation. And, of course, this is a completely anti-Marxist, anti-socialist idea. Uh, and then he takes it finally into the great economic cosmos of factory and bureaucratic life. And so it's sort of like the spirit is like a stone bouncing across economic eras. Yeah? So, and he, he calls this um, a historical ideal type. That it's say, I haven't written the history of modern capitalism. I, I haven't actually causally explained what caused modern capitalism. I've just told you what I think the mentality is and where it's come from. And where it's come from, it's actually embedded in our secular outlook today. Now, Peter will tell you uh, that if you look at his footnotes, they are incredible works of scholarship. So this, this is each of these examples, these historical ideal types, which aren't, you know, he's not a historian. He never was a historian. He's not really telling a narrative. Though in a sense, he is telling a story about our capitalist spirit. You know, nobody else had capitalism. Why did we have it? Because we had this peculiar spirit. And once we have this modern capitalism, we can't escape the spirit. Um, and so it becomes very interesting. It, it relates to this thing that why is it critically so, crit why is it so controversial? Well, you know, the, the footnotes, historians can engage with that and say, oh, no, 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 you know, D Dutch Synod didn't say that. Much disputed so. text, as someone said earlier in the program. <laughs> yes, yes. And then other people... Mild were... dispute so far, I may say, but still, maybe f fermenting a little. Anyway, I'd like to go to Linda Woodhead here. The, um, it was published a decade after Karl Marx's Das Kapital. Um, was... Well, obviously, there was a connection between Weber... Uh, not obviously. There was a connection between Weber and Marx. What was it? Well, Weber read Marx. Weber was interested in Marx's thought. Uh, but Weber is very significantly different, of course, in his whole approach. So he sees... <laughs> He sees this work as, in many ways, a refutation of a materialist conception of history, i.e. of the idea that it's the economic factors, it's the mode of production that drives history. Uh, Weber thought that's much too simplistic. He wants a much more multifactorial. You know, he wants to put in lots we've just been hearing. He wants to put in the spirit. He wants to put in religious ideas. He wants to put in culture. He thinks that there are whole sets of factors that go into shaping history. And he thinks that uh, a means of production, which Marx thought gave rise to whole eras, he thought that a means of production can give rise to many, many different social and economic orders. And that's what he was interested in. So he was really, Weber was asking a question which, which Marx didn't. Uh, Marx was interested in capital and capitalism, but he didn't ask that question, why has it come about in Western Europe and not in other parts of the world? And it was that that Weber was pushing on. Peter, Peter Ghosh, uh, what was the reaction so it came out? 1905. What what was the principal reaction, and what can you just give us some little history of the reaction when it came out, and what happened? Well, the as you say, the the essays were published in 1945, um, and the first reaction is that Weber is invited to give a summary of the thesis uh, to the Congress of German Historians in 1906. Uh, and this is, this is actually, then, his response is very, very interesting. I think I would have to say that any academic today who'd written an article and was then told that they, they were asked to be the sort of headline speaker to the entire national community of historians would be only too delighted to take this opportunity. Uh, but Weber, in fact, is far too snooty. He says, oh, no, 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 I can't be bothered with this sort of nonsense. Uh, I, shall, I shall delegate this to my, my friend and ally, the, the theologian Ernst Trelch. Um, 
shortly after that, there are attacks in the press, but I, I would have to say... Just a the, second. I, it might be useful to pause there. So did they feel let down? Did they feel this auteur was misplaced? Did they feel that their victim or their hero had escaped? Which one? No, in, in fact, they, they don't feel let down because this, this is where we come back to this point that you're, you're dealing with a galaxy of talent in yeah. Germany at this date. Trelch is a very big man, and uh, I'm sure Linda would tell you, you know, he's on plenty of sociology of religion reading lists today. A greater man than Weber, in my view. Uh, that's what that's what <laughs> the theologians oh, no, say. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> <little> stirrings <laughs> going on on my left. But uh, uh, certainly they are, in fact, considerable allies. I'm sure we could all, all agree on that. And 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 Trelch gives uh, a presentation which is actually very close to what Weber was saying. Uh, and in in fact, this is greeted. I won't say exactly in stunned silence, but certainly it is not criticised. Uh, and so the, the attacks in the periodical press that come after that, in fact, come from, frankly, quite mediocre sources. And the, the really important reactions are, in fact, I would say, twofold. One is from the theologians like Trelch, and the other is from, shall we say, the more avant-garde economists. And here I'm thinking of a man like Werner Zombart, who have taken on board Weber's point, which is also the point Linda was making, is that there's rather more to the economy than just what Marx called the capitalist mode of production. You've got to think about, uh, as it were, how people think. Um, so this produces, in fact, two sorts of very big books. Uh, Trelch's most famous work, The Social Doctrines of the Christian Churches, 1912, is without question a book produced in response to Weber. And equally, Werner Zombart, having published a book called Modern Capitalism just before the Protestant ethic uh, in 1902, then from 1909 onwards, having read the Protestant ethic, produces a whole new second wave of books about capitalism. And we're talking about two very major intellectual figures here. Can we go to the most serious uh, um, objections, Linda Woodhead, to the, um, let's go keep calling it the Protestant ethic. There were two or three serious objections. Can you just outline them briefly for us? The serious objections, and they've been made right ever from since. the time, they're ever yeah. since, ever yeah. since, and they continue to be made. There's, there's an industry of trying to refute the Protestant ethic. Uh, one serious objection is that capitalism appears elsewhere where there is no Protestantism. So it appears in some Catholic areas and it appears in Japan, for example. So how do we explain that? Well, that's later. Uh, yes. Well, and so it could have transferred as an ethic without needing the religion to sustain it in Japan. It could you're, have adapted right. itself to Japan. You're quite right, and that's the way to answer it. Right, sorry. Um, uh, keep going on with the objections. Now shut up. <laughs> they're not necessarily mine. They're other people's. No, no, no. no, no. I think I'm not personalising this. Is, this, is this. A, no, no, I think no, you're right in your personally. refutation. Um, the uh, second one is, is, is the kind of obverse of that. So it's in some countries you have the Calvinist ethic in place and you don't get capitalism. Like Scotland, for example, developed capitalism very late, but it's a, it's a Calvinist country. Uh, and then you have another body of objections, a third and final one, which look at how he characterises Calvinism and say, actually most Calvinists weren't in the least bit bothered about predestination or um, actually um, vocation didn't matter to them. You know, they're picking holes in the way in which he's interpreting Calvinism and, and saying that, well, even if Calvin said that, that wasn't actually how, how Puritans lived their lives in practice. OK, so um, Sam, Sam uh, Wimster, there was a series... He, he, back to Weber, he followed this work by, by a series of... Uh, essays on different religions, which is fascinating, where he went out and talked about why did Confucius did Buddha stand in the way of this difference. Can you just uh, say a little about that? Yes, the, the, the Protestant ethic has got these little insertions saying, well, I'm going to come back to the economic side of the argument, and there are further comparisons to be made, and indeed there's much more to be said about the history of Christianity. Um, and... He, he does a few other things. He does study on industrial uh, psychology. And then he starts writing this big encyclopedia. Epp, he's the main editor of this big encyclopedia, which has this enormous conspectus of views. And he, 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 his, his viewpoint opens up. It, it goes from, he, always, he was always good on Europe and the ancient world, but now he goes to India, to China, uh, uh, to a certain extent Persia. And he's looking at, well, these, these are very advanced civilizations. They've got advanced religions. They have technology, China especially. 
Um, they have uh, they have administration, and China, China is a standout example because China, in terms of if you were going to say which civilization was going to develop a modernity, it would have been China around about the 16th century. Uh, it had a reasonable, well, it had a communication system. It had peace. It didn't, you know, it wasn't like Europe at war, religiously and between states. Uh, it had good administration. Um, and so Weber was saying, well, uh, and they, they didn't have monopolistic guilds. So, so China had a lot going for it. So why, why, was it, why was it Europe? And he's still holding on to this idea because it's this, this application of Calvinist ideas into people's work. Compared with work Confucianist life. ideas, which and were, were Confucianist, anti yeah, yeah, Confucian which were saying, let, well, you tell us what it, that's about and then why held things back if it did. If it did, because yeah. this is highly disputed now that Weber didn't have his scholarship right, and this is very important because it's the reception of Weber into China. Um, but what he said about Confucianism is that they don't even have a concept of heaven or rather they do have a concept of heaven, Tian, uh, but it's, it's, it doesn't have a god in it, right? It's the emperor in the world, and the sky is above the heaven, and that's as far as it goes. So there's no notion of superstition. And, and the Confucian scholar is a gentleman, and religion is a dirty word, because the notion of self-perfection is reading the classics. It's an entirely secular notion. So if you take the example of uh, Jesuits who tried to be missionaries in 1700 in China, they took the view that Confucian rites and ancestor worship was not a religion at all. And this was Weber's view as well. Uh, so that you had a civilization with, you didn't have this tension between man and the world, right? The human being and the world. There, there was no punishing God. The Calvinist God is a punishing one. I mean, but for a Confucian, that's a ridiculous idea. It's uncouth. Uh, Can you, do you want to take that on, Peter Gosh, or do you want to uh, um, take on other arguments against Weber? Because well, that, 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 what, what Sam's uh, told us about the Chinese, uh, the 16th century Chinese tilt, uh, which didn't, is absolutely fascinating. I mean, it was, it was in many ways, you, you just touched the edge of it, in many ways far more advanced than Western Europe was. In many, but then maybe it was this religious factor. Um, well, I, I think that's... This, that's, is, is this disputed, is that, that, that's, that's a purely <laughs> historical question, um, which would require, I think, a, you know, a, a, an enormous army of experts to, to confront. Um, I think, I mean, Weber's simple point, um, which I th is, is really the one you yourself made, is that, like it or not, um, this economic system did emerge here first of all. Um, and, and Weber then says, um, and he says this quite clearly at the end of the Protestant ethic, he says, well, of course, now uh, you don't need to worry about what anybody thinks personally. It's a mechanism. Uh, and as a mechanism, it can be exported everywhere. And, and in that sense, this isn't a bad description in many ways of, of what's actually happened. Uh, and w whether we like it or not, we can be as, as it were, anti-Eurocentric as we like and have as much respect for traditional Chinese culture as we like. But um, if you want to do capitalism in China, uh, you're going to have to use the West as your point of reference to get going. And, and that's obviously how the Chinese economy has been developing since circa 1980. One can go back to the, the Weber said in 1911 of, Ch of Shanghai that this is modern capitalism. It's going to happen. You know, the, the notion of Marxist revolution in Europe for him was dead duck by 1900. The world was going to be capitalist and it was going to be imitated around the world. There was absolutely no problem about that. But Peter's exactly right. The Weber would have this expectation that you needed the rational inbuilt sobriety of the original capitalist to make it work. Capitalism to work needs discipline. Discipline, efficiency, rationalization, sobriety, hard work, and the existence of this world being preeminent. Uh, Linda Woodhead, um, how, we're near the end now, I'm afraid, how did I, how his ideas run through the 20th century? Have there been any sort of stop him in his tracks objections? You know, he's had a really quite, he, he's had a mixed influence. If we look at sociology, which is my area, funnily enough, I think the best bits of him got lost. I mean, sociology has neglected the importance of religion, actually, uh, and it's neglected looking at how 
the cultural mindset. and religious yeah. factors affect the economy. Mm. You know, we, when, when the banking thing came, no one's studying the spirit of capitalism today and, and what happened. So that bringing together the religious and the economic, that kind of got dropped. What has influenced a lot was another part of the idea, which is that the whole that this all eventually leads to secularisation. And that idea took hold. Weber thought that would happen eventually. It secularises. You don't need the Protestant ethic to keep the rationalised spirit going. And it, the world will become completely disenchanted, in Weber's view. You know, the iron cage of rationality takes over. We all become cogs in the capitalist machine. We lose spirit altogether. All, all now, that idea has been incredibly influential. It's kind of part of our bread and butter. Often we don't even question that idea. Uh, and yet, weirdly, it's not really what's happened. If you look around the world today, religion is flourishing, and actually a well, lot of it... Flourishing is, is a disputed word, Peter, wouldn't you say? Uh, let's, let's go on, let's is go. flourishing around the world, sure. Around, uh, outside you, Europe. Outside of Europe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but interestingly, a lot of religion that's doing really well at the moment is prosperity religion. It's very much, you know, it's a, it's a gospel which is about economic advancement. Uh, a, a, maybe an interesting, in some ways, an interesting, um, not pro proof, but Weber would have not been surprised to see that religion and the economic is still incredibly closely bound up together around the world. Finally and briefly, Peter, goes, where, is, where does Weber stand today? Uh, I, think, I think probably we would all agree that in the, in the realms of the social science, he's absolutely top of the tree. Um, that he doesn't, of course, inspire political loyalties or partisanship in the way that Marx did in the later 20th century. Um, but as a person of huge range uh, and great personal detachment, uh, I mean, he does, he does fit our world very well in all sorts of ways. Um, as Sam said, you know, he declared revolution as dead as a duck. And uh, alas, this is, this is the world we live in. That he, he, there were all sorts of things with capitalism he didn't like. But he's, his question was, is there an alternative there's no alternative to finishing now. Thank you very much, Linda Woodhead, Peter Ghosh, Sam Minister. Next week, states of matter, solid, liquid, gas and plasma. Thanks for listening. And the In Our Time podcast gets some extra time now with a few minutes of bonus material from Melvin and his guests. So, there you are. Did you enjoy that? <laughs> <laughs> You're all first-timers. It's very, very unusual. Well, after the first few months of the programme 114 years ago to have first three first... <laughs> <laughs> Initiates. Very, very fascinating, very fascinating. Well, the thing about Weber, he just unpacks and unpacks and unpacks. It's just... Uh, it's more, always more and more to be said. Mm, yeah, mm. Yeah. He's a bit of a slippery character. That's, I think that's why he's lasted, really, because he's not that clear. It's like a great religious text. It's like the Bible. Like like, it's like the Bible. So yeah. you can have an industry of interpreter forever because it's not that clear. You know, it's full of contradictions and qualifications and subtleties, and that's why there's a Weber industry, and there always will be. Hmm. No, I, I, I actually I really don't agree with that. The, the, the real problem with Weber is that there was a there was a rupture, and the, and the rupture was the First World War and Hitler. Yeah. And so the the culture from which he sprung. Uh, has just been lost. The German high culture. Yes, yeah. has been completely lost. And there was this crucial point of transition, particularly after 1945, when the great interpreters of Weber were either Americans or, very interestingly, Germans who went over to America after 1945 to work on Weber. And they're, all, they're the sociologists who really framed our modern understanding. And, for example, the, the huge great collected edition they're just completing now has been generated by people like that. Yeah. But we wouldn't. Why did you say that the other chap? How do you pronounce Trotch. it? Trotch. Why you you nipped in quickly that you thought he was much more important than Babe? There wasn't time to oh, take it up. Oh, he's got a much, 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 much more sophisticated understanding of Christianity, and he taxonomised Christianity in three main types in a way that's been influential ever since. And he was a great political thinker, and he was a great theologian. How come we're not talking about him? We're talking about Weber then. Because, Be because well, Trolls well, is clearer. No, 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 no. no. So, um, well, the, the first thing to say, of, of his famous three types, the third was given to him by Weber. Yeah. But before, before writing that book, he only had two types. And the second thing is I would dispute, I'm afraid, very, very strongly indeed that he was a great political thinker. In fact, he's a typical Lutheran uh, who says, well, actually, the most important thing in the world is religion and politics is secondary. Uh, what politics you happen to have? Well, that's a tricky question. Yeah. Uh, and don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. in, in many ways, I, I think, you know, if we're talking about, you know, what is the real meaning of the world? That's a very respectable position. You can't, you know, it's hard to I mean, argue with it. But what he is, is he's most the importantly thinker. leave out, Sam? Well, I mean, you could 
pursuing it into the 20th century, I think it's the bureaucratic rationality, which mm. is cold, impersonal, and people like... And this stems directly from Weber, you think? This, yes, this, this is actually because what we, what the bit we left out, and it's actually in the Protestant ethic, is that to run a capitalist firm, 20th century capitalist firm, you need a bureaucracy to run it, right? You need accountants, you need office managers, etc., etc. And there's no difference between the bureaucracy of the firm and the, bureauc the Prussian bureaucracy that Linda was talking about. Yeah. And it's, they both have this cold, impersonal rationality, and it squeezes out morality. The, now, the, sorry, and, no, an all, that, and an author like Hannah Arendt picks this up, and so that when you come to uh, the administration of uh, if you take the first, second and final solutions, they're all bureaucratic, right? That you deport people, hold them in refugee camps. So they come because of an impersonalisation. Yeah. I mean, the, mm. the, the thing I decided I was never going to say on the programme, <laughs> because it's just too complicated, is that he'd worked out the ethical argument. You're all banging the table, right? So you're, no, it's all right, I don't mind, we're not on earth, that's all right. Uh, he, he, he worked out the ethical argument, first of all, in the 1890s, yeah. and then he overlays it with a, a very closely related but nonetheless distinct argument about rationality. So the original argument is how you get from love your neighbour to the impersonal ethic. And the overlaid argument is an argument which is where he talks, the, thing, the, the Protestantism he talks about is actually called ascetic Protestantism. Yeah. And you move from ascetic Protestantism to rationalism. And ascetic Protestantism, this is, this is where the historians go absolutely bananas, because there is no such thing as ascetic Protestantism in the 17th century. You know, if, if you did a, a, an A-level or BA in history on religious history in the 17th century, there is no such entity. But Weber invented it, and ascetic for him means proto-rational. So the actual technical argument of part two of the text is a movement from proto-rational religious behaviour to modern rational behaviour. Another thing that struck me yesterday, I was... Um, chairing a debate about the Middle East and what's happening at the moment. And every debate you ever do about religion and politics always splits into this incredibly simplistic question about, well, is it religion that's driving violence or is it politics? And you think, Max Weber would just say, go back to kindergarten. It's not an either or. You know, is religion political? Well, especially as or he was is using it... the 17th century as his, uh, as his basic source, which is... Yeah, but we're so unsophisticated religion, in the way yeah, we yeah. think about religion. It's one simple thing and one factor. You can only have one factor. You know, religion and... Po it's, so the Middle East is religion and politics and economics, and they're all acting in an interesting way together. But to try and say it's not religious or it is or it's just political or... It's, it's crazy. I mean, in fact, you you did touch on a very important point when you were talking. You said he he famously described himself as religiously unmusical, uh, and that is actually obviously a very interesting conception because it's what it's saying is well, actually, all previous history has been musical, has been religious, and he regards the musical or religious state as the as historically normal. Uh, however, he says in the twentieth century, we moderns are not musical. And this is, is, is a very, very interesting description of sec what Lynn was saying about yeah. secularisation. Because what Weber wants to say is, well, in some sense, secularisation may have taken place. But if it, ha well, if it has taken place, it's a very odd thing, because we've moved from a situation which was, as it were, completely normal to one which is very unusual. Uh, and that so does he think that the spirit, of the ethical spirit, is, is lurking around? Ah. Well, I said, the BBC he, he, croissant is to be shared between four of us. <laughs> <laughs> right, sorry, you were saying. No, no, I mean, his, his point then is just that the, the, the need, again, as Sam was saying this, that the need for personal ethics in the modern world has been superseded by these impersonal structures which enforce codes of behaviour, whether you like it or not. I think Kafka's always the person. That, uh, Kafka's sense in the trial is wonderful illustration of the emotional stultification, isn't it, that he, he deplores. And he thinks we're trapped in it. I mean, that's a debate we haven't had. Well, are uh, we trapped? Are we well, truly again, trapped in, uh, uh, a, in a rational uh, uh, iron cage? I don't think we are. Uh, another thing I was never going to say on air is that that's actually one of the most important mistranslations of the text. It's not an iron cage, it's a steel housing. A steel-tempered housing. A steel-hard housing. Yeah. Well, why and did you in your notes, some of you, say iron cage? Right? Well, this comes it's back to Talcott Parsons, who was... The translator. The translator, American translator, uh, who who was he? He was writing the big twentieth-century classic, which came out in the late thirties, 
uh, and he did his translation in the late 20s, met Marianne of Ava, the wife, and mm. Heidelberg. And he got inspired by this work, and it's an inspired translation. He writes in his sociology like a complete, very badly, <laughs> and it's, it's really hard mm. work. But, but, the, um, but the Protestant ethic... It just flows. You can actually read it like a novel. So, mm. you know, mm. Puritanism descended on, on Merry England like a hoar frost. You know, the phrase is like this. That's good. Uh, and yeah, I don't think the average student thinks it's a novel. <laughs> it's still quite a good read compared with some sociology. <laughs> I read it as an ign ignorant undergraduate, as a narrative. I mm. mean, I think you can pick it up 